Mr. Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Eileen Uden. I'm the research intern for the Committee on Education. House Bill 2022 appropriates $1.6 million in fiscal year 2019 from the State General Fund to Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and Blind for Early Childhood and Family Education Programs. I'm happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? Okay, thank you. Members, this is my bill. I I've either spoken with you about this at, at near the end of the budget last year, or either I or someone from ASDB has met with you about this bill. Uh, for the public, what, what the, we're trying to do uh, is to provide $1.6 million ongoing dollars for um, the infant to three-year-old range of children who are deaf and or blind. And the reason why that's so important, uh, a few years ago, we had about 250 students, um, children of that age, um, that fit, fit that, and we, we've almost doubled that. We're about 457 right now with no increase in the number of teachers who are, and as you can imagine, these aren't just average teachers, I mean, like you and I, uh, who are in the classroom every day, but these are specialists who know how to deal with different types of modalities as far as um, doing these weekly home visits and helping with students who are um, deaf and or blind. And so that's the reason why this, this funding is so critical. That's why I, I've tried to champion this since last year, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, first up, I'd like to invite Superintendent Annette Reichman from the Arizona Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Good afternoon, Chairman Boyer and members of the committee. I really appreciate you giving me this time to speak with you. I don't know if I can finish in three minutes. I'm not able to speak very quickly, but I will do my best. And I appreciate the remarks that you, Chairman Boyer, have made on our behalf. I wanted to start off by just sharing a real brief story here. Last fall, ASDB Early Childhood Family Education Program published an article that I happened to read. And this article was written by one of our teachers, early intervention teachers, for the visually impaired who works on the Navajo Nation. In three short paragraphs, she talks about the challenges of driving to a home in a very remote area on dirt roads, getting there, and then trying to provide early intervention services to the family that have infants and toddlers who are visually impaired, which sometimes, as you know, in the wintertime can really be a challenge. That means that she has to be very flexible in terms of the timing and when and where and how she meets these families. And in here she talks about a two and a half year old girl with visual impairment that she met outside. She didn't say where, but they had no toys to play with, no toys to use for intervention support. And this little girl picked up a little empty Coke soda can and started putting in rocks into that can. So they played with that for a while and she said, and these, I'm quoting her directly, she said, that day this girl worked on her vision, she worked on her eye-hand coordination, she worked on her fine motor skills, she worked on depth perception, and she worked on turn-taking. Wow, I couldn't have planned that any better. This is a phenomenal example of what our <laughs> teachers do each and every day. Most of you are parents here, right? Some are even grandparents. You think about when your child was born and you were holding that child. How did you know how to be a good parent? Well, you learn from your parents, you learn from your grandparents, you learn from your extended family, you learn from other people what you needed to do to set up a home environment that was conducive and supportive of the developmental milestones that you wanted to see your child have. But suppose your baby was born deaf. Suppose you had a baby that was born blind or significantly visually impaired. Would you have known what to do as a parent? 
I'm guessing probably not. And this is where the early intervention teachers are so critical in going into the homes because they don't just work with the infants and toddlers, they work with the parents. They teach the parents how to create that same very supportive learning environment for the unique needs of their children, the infants and toddlers. For example, for a deaf baby, getting cochlear implants is not sufficient. You really need to provide access to language. Spoken language, sign language, but the child needs to develop language skills. And the most important years, as you know, is from zero to three. So that kind of support. When you have a baby who is visually impaired, there's a lot of skills that need to be explicitly taught to that baby that they wouldn't have naturally picked up by just looking around in their environment. Example of that is when you vacuum your carpet. Everyone makes the connection because they hear the noise, they see it, oh, that sound is the vacuum cleaner. But what if you couldn't see the vacuum cleaner? How would you know that sound is from your vacuum cleaner? You have to be taught that explicitly. You have to take that child over to the vacuum cleaner and feel it so they know what that is. They're able to make the connection between what's happening, why it's happening, and the sound that they hear. So that leads us to the teachers. Um, we, as Chairman Boyer just mentioned briefly, is that we have experienced a tremendous growth in the number of families we're serving. And that is directly due to the success of early identification. We have built a system here in the state and nationwide that very early on after birth, these children are being identified with hearing loss, with visual impairment, and they're being referred for services. So parents, more and more parents, are opting to use ASDB services so that we provide them with support. That number, as Chairman Moyer just said, has increased from 257 to 457 families from 2011 to 2017. The number of teachers we have has remained flat at 17. What does that mean? Well, it means very explicitly these teachers are having to juggle their caseload. And instead of doing the optimal four visits a month, they're only doing two visits a month with these families. Why is that important? Well, we have some data. ASDB has some data to suggest that if we're not doing the average of four visits a month, then our exit outcomes decline. And we are seeing that in our data. It aligns with some of the other national research that we've looked at and seen. Specifically, um, we have exit data that looks at social emotional skills. So if you think about a classroom of 10 very young children at three, in 2010, out of the 10, eight would have left with age-appropriate skills. As of today, or 2017, four to five would have left with age-appropriate skills. Cognitive skills, in 2010, we had seven out of the 10 that would have left with age-appropriate cognitive skills. As of today, four in 10. And then we talk about communication skills. Out of 10 young children, we would have had five exit at age appropriate communication skills, which is not great, by the way. That wasn't great even then. But today, that has declined to 3.5. So 3.5 students out of the 10. So for us, we really believe that the ability to bring in more teachers to expand our capacity to get back to that optimal four home visits a month. On the average, we will see better exit outcomes. That would also 
really address the gap between the urban areas and the resources that are there and the rural areas. Because in the rural areas, sometimes we're only doing one a month, one home visit a month. So this really has a tremendous impact on the outcomes of the children that we are serving. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions for Superintendent Reckman? Representative Norgard. Thank you, Chairman Boyer and uh, Ms. Reckman. So of the $1.6 million, is that to accommodate how many teachers? What What are you looking at there in your budget? We're looking at hiring 21 more teachers. I'm sorry, I meant to say that. I didn't, obviously. So specifically, that funding is really focused on bringing in 21 more teachers. So we want to more than double the number of teachers that we have in early intervention. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, members. Any other questions? OK. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, wishing to speak for the bill. Uh, Lindsay De Hoyas. Hi. Hello, my name is Lindsay De Hoyas. I am here in several capacities. I'm representing the Arizona Association of the Deaf. Um, I am the Central Region Representative, and I'm also a mother of a 14-month-old deaf daughter. I was a high school technology teacher at the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf as well for over six years. I grew up in Boston with a very strong early intervention program and the, at, at the Learning Center for Deaf Children. I moved here about seven years ago and I became a teacher at the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf and it breaks my heart to see the differences between the programs in Boston and the programs here, particularly for early intervention. The programs in Boston were quite strong and uh, many of my colleagues and deaf friends um, have been witness to the successes in their own children from zero to three with the early intervention programs available. And meeting parents here, um, they have struggled with early intervention services just lacking. Their success is not equivalent to those of other programs um, in other regions of the country. So I'm here to express my strong support for this bill. There is a significant need for improved services for our uh, birth to three-year-old deaf and blind children. Um, when my parents learned that I was deaf, um, they tried to learn sign language to the best of their ability. They uh, put me into the program in Boston for earlier intervention services, but they still um, saw, they compared uh, me to um, how I interact with my daughter because her first language is American Sign Language, and I sign with her. She still goes to speech therapy for the opportunity to um, learn to use what hearing she has left as well as learn to speak some. Um, but anything that she misses, we're able to fill in with American Sign Language, so she has that option. Her language development is there 110% because of those opportunities, and my parents, her grandparents, have seen a significant difference between how she has developed and how I developed without that language exposure when I was a child. There are so many parents who don't know what to do, and they need that early intervention education and services to know how to interact with their children so that their children can succeed with language development in whatever method they decide to use, whether it be spoken or signed language. Any questions, Chair? Members, any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Laura Hocknell. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chairman Boyer, committee members, everybody here. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and, and talk about early childhood family education. My name is Laura Hocknell. Um, I am a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, and I work for the Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and Blind. My area is the Maricopa County. I am the supervising teacher, and I supervise five teachers that go out and provide services for family. And due to our, due to our shortage, I also see uh, 25 different families on my own. Um, so I just want to leave you with a thought as I'm going through my, my presentation for you. 94% of children who are born with hearing loss, deaf or hard of hearing children, are born to parents who are hearing. And of that 
Rarely do they have any experience or prior knowledge of, of a deaf person at all or interacting with a deaf person. And um, Superintendent Reichman talked about being able to pull from our parents or our grandparents on ways to help our children grow. And Ms. De Hoyos, fortunately, her mother had some experience, and so she can pull from that plus her own personal experience, but that's very rare. So having early intervention as a way to come in and say, okay, let me answer some of these questions you have. How can we take away that vagueness, that just gray area of the unknown for these families? With early intervention, we can go into homes, we can talk with families about language modalities. How can you communicate with your child? What are some of the strategies that you can apply in everyday routines in order to make your child be able to learn to grow and to develop, just like their hearing peers. Um, I want to talk about a little guy. I started my career 22 years ago, and I have a master's in deaf education, and I started at the Mississippi School for the Deaf, and then I moved into, um, from that residential program, I moved to Yuma, Arizona, and I taught in the itinerant program there for five years before moving to Phoenix. And um, I noticed when I was in Yuma, I had a student when he was 14, freshman in high school, he came to me. And his story is that as an infant, his parents both died in a, they died at the same time. It was a car accident and they died. And he was put into the care of his grandmother and his grandfather. And so he's profoundly deaf. He can't communicate with his family. He's moved into a new situation with his grandparents. Shortly after he moved in with, with them, they also passed away. It was very unfortunate. And then he moved in with his aunt who had several children of her own but no way to know of what to do with him, and now it was time for him to go to school. He went to school, he was part of the Arizona school family all the way up through, I got him at age 14. His reading level, his communication level was at a second grade. And that can really be attributed to the fact that he did not have consistent early intervention, he didn't have that support, because those people that received that support, they weren't there. They were there for a short time and then they passed away. And it just drove home to me how important it is to have relationships, to be able to have parents be able to bond with their child, to talk with their child, to help them grow. So I moved into the early intervention field full time and I moved up here to Phoenix. In that program, what we do is we support families, we coach families, we go into the home, we meet with them at breakfast time, at nap time, if we need to go help with a bedtime routine, we will go home to their homes at night to help them with that bedtime routine. So we do things to support them and coach them and help them with the choices that they've made. If they've chosen listening and spoken language, we provide strategies to help that grow. If they have chosen American Sign Language, we provide activities and we provide support to help that grow. If they've chosen sign-supported speech, again, we support them and we help them through the process. And then we help them transition into preschool when it's time. Ms. Hockno, can we have you summarize your final comments and then see if there's any questions? Yes. The, the key point is that parents don't know what they don't know. And when they have a child who is born with an issue with deafness and they have or vision loss, that too has all its own little strategies that need to go with it. Parents need to know and be supported and be able to give to their children, to give that language, to give that input, that love, to build those relationships so that those children will be supported or be um, contributing members of society. They will be able to be successful later in school. And early intervention is a key to that. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions? Okay, next up, Abigail Sampson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Abigail Sampson. Um, I'm here to represent the parent's perspective of a child who's been in the ASDB Early Childhood Program. My son Jonah is right there asleep. It's nap time. Um, he is newly three, so he has just aged out of the program. Um, but I want to give a little bit of history. I'll try to keep it very brief so you understand how we ended up here. Um, Around six months old, he qualified for early intervention through the state of Arizona because I noticed he was not meeting milestones. Um, it was after that, a few months later, that he got a diagnosis of a very rare chromosomal disorder. Um, and just for a point of reference, um, it has nothing medically to do related to Down syndrome, but their learning difficulties are very similar. And um, I know Down syndrome is a lot more um, common for people. 
able to reference. So several months after that, he and he went through many more tests after that diagnosis and was diagnosed with mild to moderate hearing loss bilaterally. Um, a few months later, his early intervention therapist was retiring, and at that point, because of the hearing loss diagnosis, it was decided to bring Laura Hocknell in as his new team leader for early intervention. Um, and she came almost weekly. I'd say we averaged about three times a month. And as it was mentioned before, they teach not only the child, they sit and teach the parents. So the analogy I think of is you give a, a man a fish and you feed him for a day. You teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. You can sit with a child and teach them for one hour a week, but if you teach the parents, they're with them 24-7. And the child gets ongoing support and and what they need at home. We chose to try and um, try spoken language and sign with, my, with our son. He does wear hearing aids. He took them out to sleep. Um, and she took our hand and guided us through. We, at this point, I, I'm not worried about his future. Um, two years ago, I couldn't say that. He's made so much progress in the ASDB program. Um, Six months after we started working with Laura, I want to—I think it was six months, we started going to the parent-toddler group at the Phoenix ASDB location. Parents go with their child. It kind of it prepares them for preschool. We do learning activities with other peers, work on language. And I think that program prepared him for preschool very well. He's just transitioned so well. He started two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah, members, do you have any questions? Thank you for being here and for sharing your story, Mr. Bowers. Uh, believe it or not, I also am a parent, but the, the courage of anyone with any child that has a disability, be it more profound or less profound, one of my greatest fears what happens next after I'm out of the that maintenance, will they have the sufficient skills to continue? Uh, my respect is for you, and, and many, I'm sure, of the committee, and most of the committee, I don't know anybody, but respect that position that you have doing what you can. And thank you very much for what you do, and also for representing this, this particular bill today. For the bill, uh, Mark Ashton. For the bill, Maria Murphy, representing the Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and Blind. For the bill, Barbara Schrag. For the bill, Sherry Collins, representing the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. For the bill, Charles Tack, Arizona Department of Education. For the bill, Astrid Goodstein, uh, representing SELF. For the bill, Stacey Morley, Stanford Children. And for the bill, Stephanie Parra, Arizona Education Association. Members, um, is there any final discussion? Yes. Yes. Hi. 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 Members, by your vote of nine aye, zero nay, two absent, you have given House Bill 2022 a due pass recommendation. Thank you, members. Uh, next up on the agenda, House Bill 2108.